quite an amazing story. This really tells me, geez, you know, we need to get checked out if you have risk factors, especially if you have symptoms. Focus on prevention early because you never know, even if you feel great on the outside and you can exercise and run a half marathon, you never know when something like this is going to happen to you. So life lessons really, really have, have continued day after day, seems like year after year, motivating me, inspiring me to continue to spread this message. So back to the message, here's the way I think about heart disease and how we could prevent and reverse it. There's two main components. There's other nuances and exceptions and such and rare instances, rare instances. But for the most part, the two things to focus on for heart disease prevention is getting your blood cholesterol numbers down and protecting your endothelium, the lining of the inside of the artery from damage at all costs. And it's so powerful. So the, the cholesterol concept uh, was very well, um, very well kind of written out here in this article called uh, It's the Cholesterol Stupid uh, by William Roberts. And really, you know, we know there's all these risk factors, you know, genetics, inflammation, cigarette smoking, high blood pressure, diabetes, being overweight, being sedentary. Are any of them required to clog your arteries with plaque? And the answer is no. There's no research study that says you have to have high blood pressure, you have to have diabetes, you have to smoke cigarettes. No, you don't. But there is good, strong research to say that the one prerequisite that you must have to develop plaque buildup in your coronary arteries is an elevated LDL cholesterol. Other people use apolipoprotein B as a marker. Either one's fine. So basically, in other words, if your total cholesterol is low between 90 and 140, if your LDL is low, at least under 70, maybe in the mid-50 range, there is no evidence that smoking cigarettes, obesity, being sedentary, None of those things. There's no evidence that those things will clog your arteries up and contribute to heart disease risk if your baseline cholesterol numbers are so low. So again, you could say it as the prerequisite that you must have to develop plaque buildup is an elevated LDL cholesterol. So one of the main focuses on prevention is improving cholesterol, which of course is best done through diet. Yes, there's medications, which is a whole different long conversation that can be had. But diet is so much more powerful because it not only lowers your cholesterol numbers, but it also protects the endothelium from injury and inflammation. So you're really getting both of those major concepts just through one change. And so what increases your blood cholesterol levels? Well, eating cholesterol, eating saturated fats, and eating trans fats. So it's three things. And of course, which diet has no cholesterol and almost no saturated fat? and almost no pretty much trans fats. It is a whole food plant-based diet, which is what we use to prevent and reverse heart disease. And so knowing those numbers are so important. Most of the time you'll hear, oh, you want the total cholesterol under 200, you want the LDL under 100, but that's not good enough. That's not low enough. We need it lower. The Framingham study actually showed that 35% of people who had heart attacks had a total cholesterol between 150 and 200. So not low enough, it needs to be at least under 150, you know, preferably under 140 for your total cholesterol. And really there's this great, great uh, published article did this very complex statistical analysis talking about the impact of your blood cholesterol on cardiovascular health. And I summed it up here by taking one of their graphs and I put some animations over it to try to really portray the importance of LDL cholesterol and give you guys an idea statistically how important it is to get your LDL down over many years. So on the right side here, we have your cumulative risk of having a heart attack in percentage. So 1% starts here. This graph only goes as high as 16%. Down here is the age over time. And here is your cumulative LDL cholesterol exposure. How high is your LDL cholesterol over how many years is it elevated for? It's only elevated for one year, no big deal, but many people it's elevated for decades and decades and decades. So it's what we would call your cumulative LDL exposure. So when we think about the average American right here in the middle, the average American has an LDL cholesterol of 125. If you remember what I said previously, we wanted at least less than 70 to be rock solid and prevent any plaque from building up. So if we think about the average American at the age of 40, their risk of a heart attack is 1%. At the age of 60, it's 4%. At the age of 80, it is off the charts at 16%. Not quite off the charts, but it's very high. 16% risk by the age of 80. And that's with an LDL cholesterol. It's only a little bit up, 125. That's the average American, right? Now, what about, I get a lot of people that come in and their LDL cholesterol is really high. It's around 160 or so. So you look at this graph 
160 where this line goes. By the age of 40, the risk is more around 3%. By the age of 60, the risk is around 16%. And by the age of 80, it's real high. It's like 50% risk of a heart attack by the age of 80 if your cholesterol numbers are that high. Now let's take it the flip side. Let's go around to somebody who actually did eat really healthy and do all the right things. They're on a plant-based diet. They've got the LDL down to say 60, which I was able to achieve when I went on Esselstyn's diet for a couple of months. I reached ideal body weight and my LDL dropped to 60 when it was as high as the 130s in the past. If you look at the statistics here with an LDL of 60, by the age of 40, under 1% risk. By the age of 60, under 1% risk. By the age of 80, still under 1% risk. It's not 0% risk, but it's pretty darn unlikely to have a heart attack if you can get that LDL down as soon as you can in your lifetime. So the cumulative exposure to LDL is super crazy important as a concept. So we know that uh, LDL between 50 and 70 is really what we would call physiologically normal. That's where we need it to be. And we know that um, wild animals, wild primates and babies when they're born, that's where their LDL cholesterols are. Only if you introduce cholesterol and saturated fat, let them gain weight and do all these other things, then their cholesterol numbers start to go up, right? So what are optimal LDL cholesterol levels? Well, this is a graph. Each dot represents a major clinical trial and it shows what, where the LDL cholesterol was versus the risk of having a heart attack. And when we look at this, this is for primary prevention, people who've never had a heart attack. If you draw a line between all these dots and see what LDL cholesterol you need to get close to a zero risk, the number is about 55. So to get to about a zero risk of heart attack, your LDL needs to be around 55. And the sooner you get there and the longer it's there for, the better it's going to be. Now, what if you've already had a heart attack or stroke? These people are much higher risk, right? So we have a similar thing. Every dot represents thousands of people in clinical trials, and the cholesterol is down here. The risk of having a heart attack or an event is over here. Well, once you've already had a heart attack or a stroke or a stent or a bypass, we call this secondary prevention. For secondary prevention, you need to go even lower. The LDL needs to be near 30. Now, the current guidelines actually have the recommendation being at around mid-50s, even for the highest risk people. But there's evidence that would say, hmm, maybe a little bit lower is even better. So trying to get the LDL down is so important, no matter where you are in your heart disease uh, risk you know, journey. So really, the normal cholesterol numbers that we should be emphasizing is not less than 200, should be less than 150. The LDL should be at least less than 70, maybe better. We don't really worry about HDLs that much. It's more the efficiency of the efflux capacity of the HDLs that we're concerned about. And yeah, triglycerides, we like them to be low, but that's all through a lifestyle approach. Having them being slightly elevated isn't devastating as long as everything else is controlled well. So going back to our crash course on nutrition, how do we get our LDL cholesterol down? Well, don't eat the cholesterol, don't eat the saturated fats, don't eat the trans fats. And cholesterol only comes in animal foods. And we, there is no cholesterol in any plant-based food. And so just the common sense, eat a whole food, plant-based diet, it'll be cholesterol-free. There is no dietary requirement to eat cholesterol. It's not an essential nutrient. Your body can make it for you. Every cell in your body can make its own. So there's no need to bring it into your diet. And when we look at foods that are high in cholesterol, in many surveys, chicken is the number one source of cholesterol in the American diet. In a lot of other surveys, it's actually eggs, but look at chicken, how much cholesterol is in it compared to beef, almost the same. And uh, egg yolk is very high in cholesterol. And of course, eggs are the number one source. Butter is very high, but look at plant-based foods. There is no cholesterol in any plant-based food. So focus on eating unprocessed plant-based foods. Should we eat any cholesterol? This is the basic concepts here, super powerful statement from the National Academy of Medicine, used to be called the Institute of Medicine eat as little cholesterol as possible. Now, there was some confusing issues brought on by the egg industry in 2015 when they were updating the dietary guidelines. They tried to show the USDA, the all this research to say, oh, adding eggs to your diet, adding more cholesterol doesn't really affect your cholesterol numbers. Don't worry about it. And no, no, we do have to worry about it. They, they actually, of course, industry funded studies where they took people already ate a lot of cholesterol, gave them more cholesterol, said, look, it doesn't budget much. Well, that's silly. That's like taking people who smoke three packs of cigarettes and telling them to smoke a fourth pack and see how much the risk is going to increase. No, the important part is the first part that you do. So it's uh, the other analogy is it's like um, you smoke one joint. I never smoked marijuana, but I hear you smoke one joint and man, you get real high off of smoking one joint. But you smoke that second joint, eh, 
not much of an effect, right? Same thing with dietary cholesterol. You eat just a little bit, you can shoot your LDL up, but you add more to it, add another egg. Yeah, it doesn't go up that much more. So there was all this stuff. Oh, cholesterol is not a nutrition of concern, a nu nutrient of concern. Don't worry about restricting dietary cholesterol. And they were going to actually put that in the dietary guidelines. But all the major medical societies, American Heart Association, the American College of Cardiology, lots of people were like, that's crazy. Controlled metabolic ward feeding studies where they locked people in and controlled everything that they ate clearly showed that even little bits of dietary cholesterol can increase your LDL cholesterol numbers. So they went in 2015 from the statement, cholesterol is not a nutrient of concern. They never published that officially in their recommendations. They changed it over to individuals should eat as little dietary cholesterol as possible while consuming a healthy eating pattern. And of course, what do lifestyle medicine physicians interpret that as? Zero. You don't need cholesterol. Eat none. Eat a plant-based diet. We shouldn't eat any, any amount. And I've seen this in my patients. I've had patients who are like, why is my LDL still 120? Why is it still 120? I eat a plant-based diet. Well, I'm doing everything you say, Dr. Loma. All right, let's go through your food log and see. Like, wait a second. You're eating three eggs a week. And that's the only animal food that they eat is three eggs a week. And they're like, well, well, yeah, I mean, I guess so. That's not a part of a plant-based diet. I'm like, no, that's not plant-based. An egg is not plant-based. Take it out. And let's repeat your lipids in a month. And then boom, their LDL drops to 70 or less. And it's just that little amount of cholesterol. Some people are hypersensitive to it. It can be that way. So just a littlest bit of cholesterol can raise the LDL, but there's variability. This is why it's just confusing. It's confusing because of that whole concept of the initial cholesterol is the important part, not adding extra cholesterol, which confuses a lot of the data, a lot of it's uh, industry uh, sponsored. And the other confusing part is, is there's a lot of variability individually. About 30% of people are super sensitive to it, 50% moderately, 20%, you know, they can eat all the cholesterol they want, it barely changes their numbers. So that's another thing that kind of confuses this whole concept, because you may hear some people say, oh, don't worry about eating cholesterol. No, no, you definitely need to worry about eating cholesterol. Don't eat any if you can. Eat as little as possible. Make sure your LDL is down. If your LDL is up, you're eating too much cholesterol. Try to get it zero if you can. Same thing really for saturated fat, not an essential nutrient. And certainly in those controlled metabolic ward feeding studies, saturated fat was more important than dietary cholesterol. It was more profound of an increase of LDL compared to dietary cholesterol. Butter is very high in saturated fats. Cheese is the number one source in America of saturated fat. Red meat's very high, even chicken, even if boneless skinless chicken breast has some, coconut oil, palm oil, very high, and even coconut oil, even those plant-based saturated fats raise LDL. They're not good for cardiovascular health. And really, when you look at plant-based foods, essentially no saturated fats. Now, there will be some in oils, of course, even if they're plant-based like olive oil. And there will be some in nuts and seeds, avocados, there's little bits of, uh, you know, little, little amounts in there. And that's why the Ornish diet and the Esselstyn diet, which are the strictest diets, really, really eliminate or dramatically, dramatically restrict nuts and seeds because they want you to get as little saturated fat as you can to drive your LDL down as low as you can. So just like cholesterol, there is no safe amount of saturated fats, trans fats, or dietary cholesterol. And this, again, is a statement from the Institute of Medicine now called the National Academy of Medicine that any intake of cholesterol, any intake of saturated fat, any intake of trans fats above 0% of energy, any amount, will raise your LDL cholesterol, any amount. So there's no safe amount, just like there's no safe amount of smoking. Any amount can harm you. So as long as your LDLs are low, you're doing fine with your diet. But if it's high, you need to make sure you're restricting or eliminating cholesterol, saturated fat, and trans fats.